My name is Christine Hong. Um, I am an associate professor at UC Santa Cruz. I'm also an executive board member of the Korea Policy Institute. The Korea Policy Institute offers um, critical analysis of largely U.S. Uh, Korea relations. It started around uh, the time that George Bush nominated North Korea as part of the axis of evil, and you know what a number of um, progressive and left Korean Americans noticed was that, by and large, the talking heads were people who came out at, you know, on, on the news who were talking about North Korea were typically people who were from these think tanks or the national security industry that had absolutely no sense, um, sort of human sense of Korea. It's really hard to say right now what will transpire in the future. And that's because even what's unfolded thus far hasn't been predictable. We went from a president who was threatening genocide against um, North Korea, saying that he, in front of the United Nations, that he was willing to totally destroy North Korea, you know, in other contexts, that he was willing to rain down fire and fury like the world had never seen. You know, he made an endless sequence of these kinds of remarks, um, and that was all coupled with the fact that you know, he is, Trump is someone who has a businessman's approach to the military industrial complex. And so, he, you know, he is no peacemonger, that's for sure. You know, historically, the United States has made, um, created peace in various areas um, during the Cold War, and what ensued was far from peaceful. So, you know, when you think about uh, the Cold War in various parts of the Third World, it was brutal and bloody largely at the hands of the United States. So what's the nature of the peace to come? And so if we're te are we teetering between um, denuclearization or greater militarization? I don't know that the United States is capable of imagining a peace that isn't securitized, which is to say a peace that doesn't depend upon superior military force and indeed the prospect of, of future wars as part of its um, structural arrangement. Well, I mean, it's an astonishing thing. If we contrast Trump and his immediate predecessor, Barack Obama, so, you know, of course, Trump is invested in a kind of ABO policy, all but Obama. So he's invested in reversing one thing after another. But when it comes to the Asia-Pacific region, Obama was allied with a series of neoconservative hawks and had absolutely no problem having um, military and economic alliances with all of them. So both on the military end as well as on the free trade end, um, he was someone who uh, represented a tremendous amount of harm to the peoples of Asia and the Pacific. What's interesting is that it was really clear to see what Obama's stance was, for example, vis-a-vis -vis North Korea. North Korea was used as a kind of ruse for the proliferation of the U.S. military industrial complex. Any time the United States wanted to um, deploy missile defense systems in advance, it wanted to uh, do um, multilateral war games with different powers, it wanted to, um, you know, just do anything along these lines, it always used the pretext of a nuclear-armed North Korea. And this enabled uh, the United States to sell a lot of weapons. It enabled it to strengthen its military foothold in a region while encircling China. And so it was really clear to see what the Obama strategic plan was for the Asia-Pacific region. It's really unclear what the Trump strategic plan is. And that's to say that for Trump, um, by actually seeking peace potentially with North Korea, and Trump also has you know, stated when he was on the campaign trail that all these countries like Japan and South Korea should pay completely for their own um, military defense and stuff like that. And he seems to think that, the host, that, that uh, these sort of military host sites um, are getting welfare from the United States rather than being occupied militarily by you know, US forces. And what's interesting is that he 
and going against Obama's policy and having an ego investment in that is actually entertaining the possibility of dismantling a long-standing geostrategic uh, position of the United States that was forward deployed in the Asia Pacific region that was to geared toward the production of permanent war. And I'm not saying that those aren't Trump's um, investments, but he's entertaining the possibility of dismantling a structure that was cynically used to fortify U.S. militarism. The American corporate media has always portrayed North Korea in such extreme fashion as um, a kind of rogue nation, um, helmed by you know a kind of tin pot dictator, and um, you know these are classic regime change narratives that serve as pretexts for invasions of these countries in one way or the other, the application of massive sanctions regimes. But um, in um, May, Pompeo actually stated that um, America has had a history of um, becoming allies with its former um, enemies. And we can think of like Japan and how racist the American war propaganda was against the Japanese, and yet Japan became the premier client state of the United States in, in the post-World War II era. I think that it's an interesting um, and ironic feature of our times that we have a North Korean leader who has a Byungjin policy, and so this is a kind of dual policy that's aimed at, yes, the sort of historic priority of North Korea, which is to say um, mil military first or defense against the world's largest military power, the United States. But with this new leader, Kim Jong-un, the Byungjin policy also emphasizes economic development. And that's aimed at um, strengthening and uh, improving the people's livelihood. And so there's a kind of dual dimension to it, and it's not just developing uh, the nuclear program at the expense of the people. It, it was this sort of twofold thing, and he came in with this kind of policy. Donald Trump, by contrast, has referred to his foreign policy as America first, which seems to imply that it serves the interests of the average American when it doesn't. And in point of fact, Donald Trump is willing to authorize, following closely on Obama's heels, the trillion dollar uh, renovation of America's nuclear, nuclear arsenal. Um, he's also, um, you know, he's willing to throw tons of money at the war industry, and Congress even outpaces him in terms of what it's willing to authorize, and yet totally diminish, destroy any kind of social programs within this country. And so what he calls America first is not truly an America first policy. It's actually a military first policy. You know, so we're in this kind of moment in which we have these different labels, but actually I think like the meaning of these terms has, it, you know, we almost have to transpose them. Well, I think that it's interesting that Donald Trump has signaled um, that even though it appears that North Korea doesn't ne isn't necessarily calling for the withdrawal of U.S. forces from the Korean Peninsula, the United States has never militarily left the Korean Peninsula. And stations, I think Donald Trump, like, up to the number, I think he stated that there's about 32,000 U.S. troops in South Korea. It's always hovered around 30,000. And there are approximately 80 military installations um, that the United States operates. So, I mean, you have to understand that the U.S. military presence south of the DMZ is massive. But Donald Trump on the campaign trail actually called for a reduction of those forces. He didn't see the need for them to be deployed overseas. And he's actually sort of signaled something along those lines even recently. So, you know, those kinds of possibilities would be all to the good. The other thing, too, that plays a critical role is the fact that Moon Jae-in, Donald Trump, doesn't feel accountable to the American people. He doesn't care what the American people say, want, or need. The current president, Moon Jae-in, he was elected in a snap election, and that was in the wake of the ousting of the previous president, Park Geun-hye, who is um, an ultra-right-wing um, militarist, actually, you know, and uh, she walked a very hard line with regard to North Korea. 
And um, when millions of South Koreans took to the streets calling for her ouster because of corruption, because of her neoliberal policies that harmed the ordinary um, person, and because of also her policy um, that was endangering all Korean people by, you know, actually calling for more militarization of the Korean peninsula. Because of all of that, Moon Jae-in is actually deputized. Unlike these kinds of populist right-wing movements around the world, this is actually something that is very progressive in nature. And he's being deputized by the people to actually push for genuine peace with North Korea. Now the question is, is that going to be a peace that actually admits um, workers' interests? There's been one union after another in South Korea that has come forward with statements applauding the Panmunjom declaration by the two leaders of the Koreas, but stating that um, workers have to be a part of the peace process. So we should recognize that the Korean people's historic struggle against the U.S.-imposed division of their country, against the U.S. occupation of the southern part of the peninsula, has, isn't, hasn't just been... Um, a struggle for national self-determination. It's also been profoundly a class struggle. You know, I absolutely do think that there are opportunities for solidarity. There are many thinkers who have conceived of the Pacific as a people's Pacific. And you can see that people in um, Okinawa, who've been fighting against uh, the U.S. military bases, have linked up with other peoples around the Asia Pacific region. There are connections between the Philippines, between Korea, between Guam. People are rising up in a way together um, to try to raise to view the fact that these are interconnected struggles. And I think that we too have, I mean, this is a sort of guns versus butter type of argument, but we actually have an investment in this, not because, I mean, on the one hand, you can say that foreign policy is the least democratic aspect of this society. Americans have no say in this, right? And the foreign policy of the United States is militarism. Militarism really does inherit, and I, I don't use this term lightly, it inherits from fascism. It depends upon an, a concept of war unity against a shared enemy, and that war unity eviscerates any kind of class difference. So then Americans are against X group, rather than it being people having solidarity with other people. You know what I mean? And, um, but I think that it is a challenging struggle. Like on the one hand, I think that it's not just because foreign policies, our foreign policy is bad for people on the receiving end of US foreign policy. It's actually bad for people here. And so if you were going to frame it in a kind of self-interested way, does it hurt us if, um, in the zero-sum logic of everything, um, our resources, our social programs are completely depleted, you know, and instead our war budget is beefed up? Absolutely. You know, and yet that seems to be the kind of message that never seems to hit home. There's a thinker named Quan Sing Chen. He's this Taiwanese um, cultural theorist, and he came up with this term de-imperialization, and he contrasts it to decolonization. He states that empires have a different task uh, versus former colonies, you know, in terms of trying to think through the possibility of revolutionary change. And he states that the first step toward de-imperialization is demobilization. That means actually um, demilitarizing the United States. That is a really profoundly hard um, vision to sell. You know, I'm not saying that it isn't worthwhile indeed eminently so. It doesn't resonate um, in a kind of populist way, that's for sure.